But right now, we've got uh, a candidate for the state senate district here that represents Battle Creek. Mike Knopf is the uh, current state senator, but he's served all that he can by law and uh, is ready to go do something else, start a, a fourth career or whatever it is now. But uh, Dr. John Bison, our current state representative in the 62nd district, is our guest, and he is a candidate for the state senate seat. And good morning, Dr. Bison. Good morning, Tim. It is so good to be with you again today. Numbers get uh, jumbled in my head. It's the 19th Senate, right? It is the 19th Senate District, and it uh, comprises uh, all of Calhoun County, all of Barry County, and all of Ionia County, even north of Barry. It's, it's kind of clean, cut, and dry. You, you don't see that too often in politics these days. There's usually a chunk of this or that somewhere. But uh, well, They try to make the districts uh, fairly even, but this one happened to work out. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess that was the uh, redistricting of 2011 after the 2010 census. It's a fair amount of territory to cover uh, compared to the 62nd House District. And I imagine like most of the candidates, you've been knocking on doors, talking to people. Oh, we've been knocking on a lot of doors. I've got a great team working with me. And uh, thus far, uh, we have knocked uh, a lot of uh, Barry and... Ionia counties. Um, we are working down here in Calhoun County, but they know me in Calhoun County a lot mm-hmm. better than they know me elsewhere. And so I have spent significantly less time in Calhoun, but I don't want anyone to think that I'm forgetting about Calhoun County either. You know, Calhoun County is very important and we've done some terrific things down here in Calhoun County. Well, and of course, Barry is an extremely rural County and, uh, you know, for that matter, so is Ionia. Um, what are the people up there uh, telling you that they are most concerned about in state government? I think that it's pretty similar uh, regardless of where we go. It is roads, it is education, it is uh, health care, it's excessive taxation. Um, and, and so we have lots of balls in the air. There are lots of things that we have left unfinished and we need to uh, continue yeah. uh, chasing down. Like auto insurance reform, do you any hear from any of the, your constituents or your would-be constituents about that? Oh, there is. You know, it seems like a lot of people are upset with uh, the fact that auto no-fault reform is uh, is necessary, that it is um, something that we need to get out there and, in my mind, review comprehensively because I would tell you that everyone who has touched auto no-fault and continues to touch it, has made an art form out of extracting money from that system. Hmm. And we need to go back and uh, go back to the original principles of the auto no-fault reform, where we uh, look at what is necessary, find a way that we can deliver those protections in a reasonable manner, at a reasonable cost. And I think that many people would argue that uh, the system we have now is not at a reasonable cost, being perhaps the highest in the nation. The bill that would have hopefully done something about that failed, uh, but you did vote in support of that bill. I did. I thought that that was at least an initial step that we could take. It wasn't everything that I wanted to see because I would love to have all of the players at the table and make sure that everyone is contributing to the savings that our constituents need to see. So uh, other than than that, can you expound on that a little bit? How could we improve the bill that failed? What are the, what are the key things that you think we need to do to get to auto insurance reform here in Michigan? When I take a look at auto no-fault reform, I think that everyone who touches the system, as I said, mm-hmm. so we're going to be looking at a fraud authority uh, so that if we have bad players out there, that we don't have to take it through the courts and have it last five, seven years before getting an answer. Uh, We need to protect our uh, people who are injured. But right now, I think that that coverage is excessive and we cover a lot of people who are not paying into the system. We have a a thing called assigned claims where if you're uninsured and and you're driving somebody else's car and hit somebody else who is in a similar situation, we still cover you and and you kind of scratch your head and walk away saying, you know, why are we covering people who have made the conscious decision not to 
uh, not to get coverage, uh, not to be covered under this system. Um, if you take a look at um, repairs, for instance, I had a little chip in my window and I pulled up to one of these roadside stations that were filling the chip mm-hmm. and it would have been uh, $25 if, if I had paid for that out of pocket. They talked me into billing it to insurance. And when I got the bill from insurance, I found that they billed insurance the $75 rather than the $25 that it would have cost me. And is that fraud or is that insurance billing or, you know, I just don't know where to, where to take that. And you get the same thing through the hospital system. You know, if you, if you have an MRI due to a, auto accident, the payment on that is substantially higher than your Blue Cross Blue Shield or Medicare or any of the other plans. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a question of, uh, um, is this a new art form that uh, the hospitals have come up with? And um, you have the the long-term benefits. One of the the theories on auto no-fault was that we were supposed to get lawyers out of the system. And now we have four times as many lawsuits as when they initiated the bill back in the, I believe it was the 1980s that they, that we initially started auto no fault. Mm-hmm. And um, there's just something wrong with the system when everyone seems to be making an art form of their billing on the system. I got a lot of uh, campaign literature in the mail, you know, right now, probably six or seven a day. Uh, and a lot of them are, are from your campaign uh, and some from your opponent. Um, I uh, did see one that talked about our opiate crisis, and I think it was attacking you for voting against some bills. Um, this, well, first of all, let me say, I, I think it probably is a serious problem. There are people. Oh, there's with no doubt problems. that it's a serious problem. I also think that uh, it's being sensationalized and used as a political football. And um, in talking to my own doctor, it seems to me like um, the politicians, <laughs> and you're both a doctor and a politician. This is why <laughs> I bring this up. Politicians are like, yeah, we're going to we're gonna make some hay out of this. We'll get some votes and stuff, and uh, let's see, who can we get? Well, the only thing you can do is put the screws to the dock, and, and that's think, what we're doing. And that's why I voted against it. You know, I, I think that we need a system. This was a pendulum that had swung too far. We do need to be uh, comprehensive. And when I got the mailer, I took a look at it. And I said, who is this Michigan for traditional values that put it out? It was a question as to uh, um, who is behind uh, this sort of negative campaigning. And uh, we found out that uh, it was a group that was just incorporated about two months ago. It was incorporated sometime in July. And so this is one of those shadowy groups that uh, doesn't want to be identified as uh, making a contribution. And, And you have to ask yourself, um, why would they be supportive of Qualton if they are uh, quite so uh, refusing to identify themselves if they're going to be making statements mm-hmm. like this? But my position on health care has been clear. We have uh, stated for several months that if you go to my webpage, if you go to my website, um, we know that opioids are a problem, that they're deadly and it's getting worse. And that we need to take care of our people. Uh, But there are others that are going to be hurt by the measures that were put forth. Uh, We had to go back already and uh, redo the uh, legislation that was passed in order to allow hospice patients to get the medications that they need at the end of life. And you take a look at what we have done for... uh, people who are in acute pain or even people who are in chronic pain with their uh, arthritis or any other disease process that is painful. Um, and it seems like nowadays we're almost treating them like criminals. That uh, Well, and, and, you know, also people who have responsibly used drugs like Vicodin um, in some of the more, uh, I would say, uh, milder, not as strong opiates, 
they're they're being punished. They're going to be denied. Their doctors are having to jump through hoops. Uh, people who want to have a prescription for that are going to have to pay for extremely expensive testing just to prove that they're using it and not selling it on the street. It's ridiculous. I, you know, I think we if we just put the clamps on fentanyl, we could probably, uh, you know, knock out about three quarters of this problem. And fentanyl is something that largely comes in from overseas. Fentanyl is something that typically a doctor does not prescribe in in film in pill form. There is a film, there is a patch that you can use that has some fentanyl in it. But uh, I haven't seen many prescriptions going out for that. Fentanyl we give intravenously at time of anesthesia. Yeah. But um, well, let me add Oxycontin to that list, too. Uh, and Oxycontin is much more common to be prescribed. And there are those who I know have been abusive in their prescribing of that. But I also know of several doctors and, and pharmacies as well who have been called on the carpet for the amount of narcotics that they do prescribe already. And this is something that's going to be an ongoing thing that we need to protect the public from. And uh, I'm told that with narcotics... The federal government is uh, taking a look at it, and my hope is that uh, the federal guidelines are going to be more reasonable, and then we can bring the state back in line with the federal guidelines, uh, hopefully sometime in the near future. State Representative Dr. John Bison, who is running for the 19th State Senate District, primary two weeks from today, is our guest right now. And, uh, you know, we're talking also about the uh, roads, and uh, your opponent, Mike Colton, said, uh, you know, we need to uh, revisit uh, um, state, uh, what do I want to say, 51. Oh, Public, Act. Public Act 51. 51 from 1951. It's been a long time since we have visited it. Yeah. Um, and, what do you think about, I mean, do we need to revamp how we fund um, our roads, uh, and, and uh, especially to benefit uh uh, townships are townships the ones who are in rural areas left out and um we need to do our roads differently is what i would would argue that it almost seems like uh when you talk about roads and mdot the michigan department of transportation this almost seems more like a jobs program than a roads program that they're out there in the middle of winter shoveling a little bit of asphalt into this uh water-filled snow-covered hole pothole that is out there mm -hmm. and uh even when they are building new roads it seems like those last those roads last for two or three years as opposed to a much more reasonable time so i would look to uh using improved products perhaps the rubberized asphalt that they use in uh, states surrounding us in similar climates that seem to last twice as long the, the people who do commercial roads We'll use this rubberized asphalt that has a little bit more give and, and seems to last for a longer period of time. Um, Do we need to revamp, though, uh, Public Act 51 to just change how we fund uh, townships and rural areas? I saw recently an attorney general letter that came down that said that it was the county that was responsible for the roads within the county to include the township roads. But I think that was just somebody who happened to be associated with the attorney general's office. It wasn't really an official uh, letter, was it? I think it was an official letter that was signed off by the uh, the copy that I saw. Okay. was uh, one that was signed off by the department. So that would put the onus on the counties to do uh, like to Leroy do the appropriate Township thing and, and that type. Yes, of thing. and and there are those right now. You need to match uh, something from the other end. Mm -hmm. That brings into question whether or not uh, that standard is the appropriate standard for the state and that's a question that is still outstanding in my mind that um you know we have counties uh, who have passed road we have had townships that have passed roads mill millages and so they are paying in and and they have some roads that are a little bit nicer than some of the others there are townships that do have other sources of income and uh, those seem to be doing reasonably well. And then there are those who do nothing at all. And there are those who uh, have very little capital to put into the system. And, yeah, I think that it would be something that would be up to be looked at. Because um, if they don't have anything, then they don't get any match. Oftentimes that is the case, and, yes. Yeah, so all of a sudden it's like, uh, okay, if you don't, it's sort of like buying a lottery ticket. If you don't buy one, you can't win. 
Uh, if you're a rural township and you don't figure out some way, either through a special assessment or through mm-hmm. a millage, uh, to have some money on the table for roads, and you're not going to get any match from the state, and so nothing gets done. And oftentimes, um, we need to make sure that those roads are also taken care of. One of the best roads departments in the state uh, is the one up at Barry County, and I've sat down and I've talked with those uh, uh, road commissioners or that they have up there, uh, their roads people, and uh, they were very kind to uh, share and offer to share with Calhoun County what they are doing and how they became. Uh, and not every road is asphalted in Barry County. Uh, they have all oh. the mm-hmm. main roads that are uh, pretty nicely done, and they have, in my mind, fewer potholes there than we have here on all of our various other roads. But they also have roads where they have this um, clay crushed stone mix Mm -hmm. that seems to uh, be a very nice road to drive on in the middle of winter and it is much much easier to maintain and a lot more least less expensive uh and Very it's much good so. for the car wash uh, operators. Indeed too. it is. You get awfully <laughs> dusty going up and down those roads. And um, John, so, before I run out of time here, yeah. I, I meant to ask you, tell us why, what are the differences between you and your opponent, Mike Calton? Why uh, would you uh, want people to vote for you rather than Mike Calton for the state Senate seat? I think you could tell a lot by the people who are uh, endorsing the two campaigns. You'll find that in my campaign, we have a lot of the more traditional, the more conservative people lining up on my side of the pit campaign. And on Mike's side of the campaign, uh, he's got some wild actors that typically um, endorse a lot of Democrats. Uh, the trial lawyers, for instance, and the unions are endorsing uh, Mike in this campaign. And I think that that in and of itself tells you a lot about the uh, candidates and the uh, so you're saying you're the more conservative candidate of the two? I would be the very much more conservative candidate of the mm-hmm. two, sir. All right. Best of luck to you. I'm sure uh, people will be out there seeing you. You've already knocked on a lot of doors, probably have a lot more to knock on in the next two weeks. We do. Uh, we're not giving up. We're uh, uh, kicking up the speed just a little bit here. Yeah. Thank you Bison, so much. Thank you for being with us.